All right, all right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Autodesk Virtual Academy. This is your voice in the sky, Nigel Lambayek here, Customer Success Manager, and your host for today and just about every other day. Uh, today, I'm joined by Matt Bussey. How's it going, Matt? Well, I'm awake. That's half the battle. There you go. Um, Matt's one of our uh, senior solution architects on the team, uh, meaning that Matt puts together a lot of the project planning uh, for some really large automation uh, projects, right? Whether they be design automation or process automation, right? Matt, Matt's really a go-to guy to answer a lot of those questions, which is coincidentally why Matt decided that we're going to go ahead and go ahead and show you guys some of these inventor API, iLogic tips and tricks, things that I think Matt's learned over the course of his learning experience through a lot of this automation, things that might not be, um, you know, obvious and things that save a lot of time. So I'm really glad, Matt, you're here. I'm gonna learn a lot, I'm sure. Uh, anything else to add besides that, Matt? No, I mean, the whole impetus behind this is I'm an engineer, so by definition, I'm lazy. So all this is to support me being lazy. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, just find the most efficient way to finish things with the least amount of error. Awesome, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them into your respective chat panels, wherever you are. I'll go ahead and monitor those and make sure those get answered. And uh, we're in for a really great session. Matt, take it away. All right. So let's talk. Let's do a quick overview of what, what I'm planning to present to you all today. So first thing is that we'll look at iLogic. And actually, we'll look at using the Inventor API inside of iLogic to enhance the capabilities of iLogic. So we'll look at specifically using visualbasic.net. Everything out I do that's API based will be in, in, in the VB language, but it's all translatable into C-sharp as well. Um, so we'll look at using VB.net and the Inventor API inside of iLogic to copy design proof your iLogic. If you've used iLogic and Vault together, you know that they don't necessarily play well together. So we'll look at ways of helping that problem. We'll also look at using it to overcome some limitations. So uh, the example I'll show you is how to make a quote unquote associative user coordinate system in an assembly. After that, we'll actually go into looking at directly at using the Inventor API through Visual Basic.net and Visual Studio and look at some ways if you're going to that level of automation in your in your day to day work, how to make your life easier. So we'll look at something called extension methods. This is something that's been around for .NET programming for a long time, but most people who pick up .NET programming kind of casually don't really know what they are, but we'll look at them and, and how we can use them to extend the Inventor API to make your life easier in terms of using the objects that you get out of the Inventor API. And then we'll take what we learned there and we'll look at solving some problems that typically come up with drawings. We'll also look at um, a tool that was built by an old colleague of mine called Attribute Helper that can help you put attributes on things in Inventor those are very useful in terms of doing automation and in terms of especially automating for drawings. Um, we'll look at how to create what we learned in terms of extension methods to find the curves that we want to dimension for a drawing. And we'll look at um, reducing dimensioning headaches, specifically something that tends to come up quite often that most people don't really understand when they first get into trying to write against the Inventor API to automate drawings. Uh, and then finally, I'll go over some useful references, just in, just in general, some general programming references that you might find useful if you're looking to level up your skills, okay? All right, so first of all, let's talk about iLogic and using the Inventor API with iLogic. Now, um, that old copy design problem, um, if you, again, if you've used iLogic with Vault, one of the things that you know is that when you do a copy design in the Vault, it can break your iLogic code. Okay, iLogic is great. It's a powerful way to automate your designs, but Vault Copy Design can break it. And, and why is that? Well, it's because of file names, typically. There could be other reasons, but this is the most, this is the most common one. So in an example, this is an iLogic command parameter. This is you typically use, like say in an assembly, to pass a value to a parameter in a child. So in this particular case, I have a child named sliding door frame. I want to pass it I want to pass to its parameter name height, my own parameter name height. This is a typical way of copying parameters down from one level to the next level in a, in a hierarchical assembly. Now, why does this break? Well, it's because when you come in and do a copy design, 
what happens typically? Well, typically the file name of the child changes. But this is, if this is hard coded into your iLogic, this name, Vault doesn't have the capability of going in and, and understanding that this is supposed to be a file name, one, and two, knowing what it should change it to. And to be honest, even if it did have that capability, you probably wouldn't want it to do it on any large complex type of iLogic. Uh, I don't know about any of you, but have you ever used things to try to automate fixing your code? Yeah, sometimes they work, a lot of times they don't. So how do we overcome this problem then? Uh, because we would like to use iLogic and use it a lot. We also would like to use Vault and use it a lot. We'd also like to reuse our designs and reuse them a lot. So how do we fix this problem? Well, we use a little inventor API in VB.net inside of our iLogic. And so let's start off and I will show you that. So here's an example of a component that I created. This is going to be a, a library component I'm going to reuse in my automation or in my designs day in and day out. This is just a simple sliding door, okay? It's a two-part assembly. And the parts it's made up of are this frame that you can see has a stationary pane of glass, has some grooves in there for the sliding door, and then the actual panel itself, okay? Now, in here, I've already got some iLogic set up for each of the individual parts, and they do some kind of nifty things. So, for example, if my sliding door is supposed to be on the interior or the exterior, it will change which side the handle is on. Uh, you know, if I come in here and I change the height, if I change the height, uh, et cetera. So, you know, some typical things that you typically expect with using parameters and using some iLogic. The iLogic code in here is pretty simple. It's, it's saying, hey, if, if my slide door position is interior, then, then set this feature, you know, uh, I'm sorry, suppress this feature or, act or activate that feature, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the sliding door frame. It's also got some parameters, some identically named parameters actually for like the width, depth, height, and frame depth. The sliding door and the, and the closed position. So again, if I have a if the closed side, that's the side that the the non-moving glass is on and change. And whether it's interior or exterior, it might be hard to see there, but you notice it's swapping the glass pane back and forth of where it's supposed to be, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna come in on my sliding door and I wanna have this be able to update itself with all of that, okay? So typically what we would do is, um, let me actually, let me go in here for a second. I, in this, I also have the basically the exact same parameters with the exception of, of, of one of them that I can pass down, okay? Now, typically the way I would pass those down in iLogic is do a command like this, parameters, sliding door frame one, height equals height, okay? So that's the only one I've got set up right now. So if I come in here and I change this to 90, right now it's only sending it to the sliding door frame, it's not sending it to the other panel, but you see how it's passing it down, okay? Now, oops, there we go. Now, if I went into my iLogic and I, again, hard put all these things in, that would all work until I do a copy design. So how am I gonna fix this? How am I gonna not have the name, the hard-coded name of the file or the occurrence be a factor in here? Well, this is where I can come in. I can, again, I can use a little bit of vb.net and a little bit of inventor um, API. So first things first I'm going to do is I need to come in, first of all, I need to change my constraints. So one of the things that I have in here is I have constraints for this sliding panel to change which side it's, it's, it is attached to, okay? So if I come in here and I change in, you know, I go to interior, you notice that it's moving things around in terms of, it's actually suppressing and unsuppressing constraints to move the door around. Okay, that's all basic iLogic. None of that is inventor API, okay? These are all iLogic commands pretty much. Now it's for passing the parameters down, that's where I wanna get something that's a bit more robust. So this is what I can do. I can come in and I can write code like this. One of the great things about iLogic, original iLogic, you couldn't do this, but in current modern iLogic, you can. You can actually write vb.net commands 
in the iLogic code and it will execute them. And you can execute them against Inventor um, API. So this, the, this declaration of, of dimension and O assembly doc as an assembly document, that's all Inventor API, okay? O assembly this doc dot document, guess what? That comes from iLogic. Same thing again here, creating a component definition. Assign a component definition, again, the O assembly doc, that's iLogic, okay? So we're coming in here, or actually, I'm sorry, that one actually is uh, Inventor API. So then when I wanna set the parameters, this is what I can do. I can create a vb.net for each loop. So basically when you have a component definition of an assembly, you can get something called occurrences off of it. Let's zoom in there a little bit. Occurrences basically is a collection of all the child occurrences. So inside of this assembly. And so I can go in and loop. So for each loop, I can create, I can get each component occurrence one at a time. Once I have that component occurrence, I can then use the iLogic parameter, okay? But I can pass it the name from the inventor API object. And that name is actually the file name, okay? This is the human readable name of the component occurrence, okay? By doing this and setting this up this way, this now passes all those parameters to each component one at a time without having to know the, com the component's name or occurrence name up front. Okay? So I'll save and run this. So now that I have that set, when I come in here and I, again, I can change my height, it's passing everything down, change my width, passing everything down. Coming in and doing my interior side, notice how to swap the glass, swap the door. Do it to the left, swap the glass, swap the door. All right, all that is well and good. Now, here's the real test. I go to my vault. Well, first I gotta actually log into my vault. So I'll go in and, and log into my vault, all right? And let me go up here. We'll find this in my vault under assets right now. See everything's checked out. It's waiting to be checked in. So I will come in and I will check this in. That is inventor API to I logic. All right. I've done that. We're going to check everything in. Now that everything's checked in, what we're going to do is we're going to do a copy design on this. Okay, top design. All right, we're gonna come in here. We're gonna copy these to the output folder. And then I will come in and I will do, the, okay, yes, the naming here. Let's do a find and replace instead of copy of, we'll go ahead and put the demo underscore all those. That's good. We'll run this. All right. Now if we come over here to output, here's my ABA demo. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get that and check them all out. Bring them down. Okay. So now I come in here. I could have opened it from vaults, but I'm a little old school. Sometimes I just open it locally like this. If I open this up now, I'm sure we can all agree the names have all changed, okay? But my iLogic code did not break. How about that? So that's a great way to write robust iLogic code. Now, one of the things I will tell you is that when you write it like this, one of the downsides to what I have here is that you have to have the same name parameter that you're passing in every single component occurrence. Okay, now that can be problematic because if you see here for the door, I don't actually need the closed side. It's not used inside of here, but I had to create it as just an empty parameter just so that I um, didn't have any problems. Now, if I didn't want to do that, 
to save myself some time, what I could do instead is this. I could write something a little more sophisticated than this I have right here. I'm just going to comment this out for the moment. And then I could write something a little, like I said, a little more sophisticated that looks something a little more like this. Inside of my for each loop. Actually, I didn't actually need to do it this way. So this looks, this is a little more complicated, but basically what I can come in here and do is come into each occurrence, get its parameter list, and I have to know whether it's a part document or an assembly document in order to get the parameter list correctly. This is the way that the, these things work in the Inventor API. Won't go into depth of why it works that way, but this is it. Also, don't worry about if you want to get this code, we will provide a way for you to get this source code at the end. And then you come in and you do what's called a try catch. Basically what this does in Visual Basic is it says, hey, try to do this. And if you can't, then do this if you catch an error, okay? So in this particular case, we know that closed side is no longer in my uh, door panel in here, okay? But if I come in here and I run something, let me change this like interior. Okay. Notice we don't have a problem. The reason we don't have a problem is that it just ignores that with the try catch. Okay. All right. So now we have a little bit of an idea of how we might be able to use um, uh, um, uh, yeah, sure, I'll check. use Inventor API with iLogic to overcome some problems. Let's look at some, let's look at another way of, of being able to utilize this. Now, one of the things that for us here at Katib when we're doing large, sophisticated automation projects. It's very common to need a, a common way of, of taking piece parts or sub-assemblies and inserting them into larger assemblies using a known coordinate system, okay? It's also very common for us to have customers who when they created their parts that we're trying to reuse, that they created it off of an origin that doesn't really work for how we need to position. So in this particular case, this, this door assembly, it was created with the origin point back here, okay? But the truth of the matter is, is that that's not the insertion point that we need to use for our automation. We actually need an insertion point that's on the opposite side. But the problem with that, in the case of an assembly, is that since, it, since the part itself is anchored to the origin here, whenever it changes sizes, this, the point on this side is always moving back and forth. So if I want to use a UCS at the assembly level, I can't anchor it there and have it move there, okay? But what I can do is this. I can come in at the part level, and I can create a UCS here that will move with that. That's an associative UCS. It's actually associated with this vertex right here around the corner. So when, this, so when this changes width, let's see, this other way, that UCS will move around, okay? So in here, again, let's, come in, let's make this 90 so everything's all, whoops. I haven't fixed this one yet. Sorry, give me a second here. I forgot to copy and paste this into everything. There we go. Yep, it's not there. <laughs> Let me, we don't need to see that every time it runs. All right, there we go. 
So this UCS that you see here, that's on the frame. This UCS that you see here, this is in the assembly. So what I can do is this. Again, it's a little bit of a mix of iLogic and the Inventor API, but I'll come in here and I will write this. So again, I'm getting the assembly document and the component definition. And then I'm saying, hey, I want to find it. I want to find the assembly UCS. Okay. And then I need to create some what's called a matrices. Okay. Let's see, I'm missing some of my code here. Give me just one second. Oh, yeah. All right. So what this is going to do is, is this is going to look at, um, This is going to come in here and it's going to look for a possible UCS, okay? Inside the assembly where it's user coordinate system, okay? So basically saying, hey, I might have more than one UCS in my assembly, but this is the one that you've been searching UCS. That's the one I actually want to move around, okay? Let me save that and close that for a minute. So I need to rename this. to insertion UCS, okay? So this will come in and it'll find my assembly UCS, okay, out of all the possible UCSs. Now, this little bit of code here, what's going on is now I need, I'm gonna go in and look up all of my occurrences, all of my children, okay? And if, there are, if any of them are parked, I could have sub-assemblies as children. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and grab, if, it's a, if it happens to be a part, then I'm gonna look inside a bit and say, hey, do you have any user coordinate systems? So if the count is greater than zero, then the answer is yes. Then again, I'm gonna look for a UCS and a child, also named insertion. When I find the two, then what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna get the transformation matrix. This is the location and rotation, okay, of the occurrence where I find that, where I find this UCS in. I'm then going to set up the transformation of my assembly UCS to be the same as the child UCS. I'm gonna transform it and then apply it to the assembly UCS. A lot of work, but the end result is this. Don't blink. Because if you blink, you'll miss it. Now, if I come into the frame and I hide this UCS, I make it invisible. That, the running UCS there, that is the assembly UCS. So now, as that changes, the assembly UCS, whoops. Here we go. Missed a trigger on there. I'll have to go back and double check that. I may have a trigger that's not triggering right now. Or it may just need to catch it. Yeah, I've got a trigger. I've got triggers turned off. Apologize with that. Anyways, so Nigel, do we have any questions on that in terms of using the Inventor API with iLogic to help uh, get you some things done? Yeah, there's a there's a couple here. There's one from from a good friend here, Andy. Um, I guess he's referencing when you use the the for each loops. Uh, mm -hmm. asking, won't the for each loop interfere if you add a new part that has the height parameter but is not related to the height of said frame? Yeah, you have to be careful with things like that to make sure that um, you've got your, your, your names well defined and delineated between different things. So yes, you do have to take that into consideration. That's part of what you have to do. Basically, you got to plan that out before you start using it. Long, way. long story short. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Um, that, I think that's it for right now. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some Inventor API specific stuff. Okay. Let's see. Oh, we had meant, meant to show. I forgot to go back to my presentation. So yeah, what, 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 whoops, I can go the right way. So yeah, obviously a use with the UCS, we just talked about that. So a bonus tip here, if every once in a while we have some hardcore programmers slip in, 
Uh, most of our customers tend to be, you know, mechanical engineers, mechanical designers that have picked up programming along the way. But every once in a while, we'll have customers where it's the opposite. They're hardcore programmers that have picked up a little bit of inventor along the way. So for you hardcore developers, just so you know, you can write link queries in the iLogic code. For those of you who don't understand what that sentence means, don't worry about it. You don't need them. But I'll explain what they are just so you know. For each loops, one of the things that when you're doing a lot of development, one of the problems with especially large for each loops is that it can be hard to understand what's going on in terms of what's the logic that's being done. So .NET gives you the ability to write something called a link query, which is almost like writing a, a, a SQL query. And basically the reason that developers tend to like it is that they call it self-documenting. So if you took a quick glance at this for each loop, could you tell me what the purpose of it is? Maybe. But with this, basically what this is telling a developer is, hey, from the possible UCSs that are in this user coordinate system collection, where I have one that has a name of insertion UCS, then select that, then select that and give me the first one of everything you can find. That's what a link query basically does for you. So just so if, you're, if you happen to be a hardcore programmer, you know link queries, yes, you can do link queries inside of iLogic. It will work. All right, so let's talk about better, let's talk about using .NET and the Inventor API, or let's talk about using .NET capabilities to make using the Inventor API easier for you. So I actually tend to spend my day writing a whole lot of code directly in C Sharp or, or VB.NET. I do also write things in iLogic, but we tend to, on our larger projects, use them with each other. Um, and so one of the things that we, um, um, like to do is try to make repetitive tasks or things that the inventor API doesn't necessarily make easy a little bit easier for us. One of the ways we do that is we create things called extension methods. Now I'm not going to go into detail what extension methods truly are. If you're interested in that, I'll give you some references for some books at the end that where you can go digging into this. But basically an extension method, it's a compiler trick. Basically allows you to add functionality to stuff you didn't create. Okay, uh, so let me give you an example. I'm going to show you how to add rounding to a number object in .NET to give you a simple idea of what an extension method is. I'm going to show you how to create that now, but we'll come back to actually using it later. Okay, so I'm going to come into, I've created a, a simple project here. Right now, I, I've got some code in here that I'm going to re-enable here in a minute. But the first thing I'm gonna do is this. I have some extension methods I've already created in here, but I'm gonna create a new one just to show you from scratch how to create one. Actually, let me do it from up here. And get that stuff out of the way so it's hidden. So first of all, if you're in a .NET um, program, you've set something up, you have to, if you're in Visual Basic, this is the syntax, you have to import the system.runtime.compiler services. This is required to create an, what's called an extension method. So to create an extension method, you can do, do this. You basically start a less than sign. It should automatically put the, equal, the greater than sign here. Extension, all right? And then after this, you start writing a standard function or subroutine as normal, okay? We call this one round. And then say a number as double, okay? And it's gonna return as double. So this is, this is gonna create a basic function, okay? And you notice that function, I'm passing in one argument and it's a type double, all right? So what I wanna do is I'm gonna, oops, let me pass in a second argument here. Um, digits as integer. All right. Now, so far this looks like a normal function you would write in any kind of visual basic code, any kind of C sharp code, all right? And I don't want to try to remember this off the top of my head, so I'm going to actually define this for myself so I'm actually doing it correctly. There we go. So basically what I'm going to do is I want to round this, but I want to round it to a number of significant digits. And there's several different ways you can do this, but this is the basic function call that you do. Whoops. You would, you would take a math function in this case. Oops, that's not the round. That's the ceiling. I grabbed the wrong one. Give me a second. <laughs> round there we go 
Now, here's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to return a number rounded to the number of significant units. Now, you can say, well, Matt, this is a pretty simple, that's a pretty simple line. Why wouldn't you just write that directly? No reason I wouldn't. I'm just using this as an example to show you how to create an extension method and what it does for you. So now, let me go back into my, my main module here for a second. Now, I'm going to dimension uh, a number as a double, and I'm going to set it equal to 1.234. I'm just going to give it some garbage. Good. Okay. And I'll do a console.write line. This is a console application, which means it'll bring up a Windows command prompt. And I'm just going to write that. Uh, a, no, oops, a number is plus a number uh, to string. Okay. Now, if I wanted to get this rounded to five significant digits, yes, I could just write this line, but because I've now added this round function as an extension, an extension method extends the object that's the type of the first argument. What is, so what does all that garbage good mean? It means I can write this. A number to five, let's see, five digits is plus a number dot round. See this? Let me back up for a second. If I came in here and I commented this out, and went back here, a number, do you see round on the list? No, you don't. An extension method actually adds what you're creating to that object so it's available to reuse as part of the object. So one of the real advantages to doing this is that if you have to write kind of complicated things that you're doing over and over again, that are you're always doing the same type of object, you can create them as extension method then you never have to remember, well, what was the name of that? How do I get access to it? What arguments do I have to pass to it? And again, dot to string. So when I run this, whoops, I should have put a pause. Oops, let me put a pause in there. <laughs> I actually have it stop so you can see it before it closes. There you go. Okay. So that's what an extension method is. That's what it can do for you. All right, so now, what does this have to do with uh, the Inventor API? Well, I will show you. Quite often, there can be really tedious tasks that you have to do over and over again in the Inventor API that you go, oh, why can't there just be a shortcut to this? Um, and so, I'm going to show you one of those right now. One of the more common things that, that we have to do is we have to get the file name of an assembly occurrence. Getting the file name of the, of the document that created the assembly occurrence, you actually have to go through a lot of hoops to get to that. And having to remember those hoops can be kind of a pain, to be honest. So what I would love to be able to do is I would love to be able to write code that looks basically like this. So if I wanted to get, so if I, let me come into, you know, if we're looking at this simple assembly, there's only two parts in here, okay? But imagine if there were like 50 parts or 100 parts. If I wanted to get the file name for each one of those, you know, I would usually loop through, loop through them. And what I would, so what I would love to write is something that basically looks like this. So I want to get the active document, and I would love to, you know, if it's an assembly document, then I would love to come in, and I would like to, find each child occurrence, and just for that child occurrence, just get the document file name. This function doesn't exist. You can't get the document file name directly from the child. Matter of fact, if I come in here and start, well, let's see, did I act? Oh, I did, I, I have them in here. I forgot, this is stuff I hid. I was testing it this morning, I forgot to hide it. Let me hide this so it's not there. There we go. So, See, that stuff doesn't exist. My doc doesn't exist. Matter of fact, this stuff right here doesn't exist either. So I can write extension methods on Inventor, on the Inventor objects, and I have a few of them that I've written here. So the first one is this, is if I want the document name 
of the file that created this occurrence. I can write an extension method that basically returns a string. And what does this extension method do? It comes in here and says, okay, first of all, is this occurrence, is it a part document or an assembly document? And if it's one of those documents, then give me the, the definition, the document. So usually what you have to do is you have to go into the occurrence, get the component definition, get the document to create a component definition, do what's called a cast, that's what the C type does. You have to cast it into a part document and then get the full file name. But what if it's an assembly document? Because I don't know if an occurrence is assembly or part when I first get it. Well, then I have to start doing a select. So this encapsulates all of it. In the case it's not a partner assembly, it returns nothing, okay? So now that I have that as an extension method, when I come in here, oops, let me find the right one. Helps if I hit, click on the right tab, I can do my doc file name, okay? Now I have a couple of other extension methods in here as well that I'm using like two assembly component definition. So one of the things that drives me nuts in particular is that when I actually get, I keep on the wrong tab, when I actually get a, uh, uh, a, a, an occurrence or a usually it's more like a component definition, I usually get the generic component definition, which means I then have to say, are you a part or an assembly? Then I have to cast it again, then I can get its occurrences. So, this two assembly component definition. Again, it takes an unknown component definition, a generic one. And if it happens to be an assembly component definition, then it, then it casts it and returns it for me. If it doesn't, then it returns nothing. And I can do error checking on that. So when this is all said and done, I come in here and run this. So right now, it has this active inventor session. It has this, if I get the child document names, you can see it returns each one for me. If I come back and I change this to a part, it says that hey, this is a part file with no children, okay? But this is the power of the extension methods is that, you know, basically as we're looking at this, this is a bunch of lines of code that have been simplified down. So I only really, only really had to write two lines of code. Got any questions up to this point? I saw a couple of potential questions pop up, Nagel. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, let's see here. Um, first one, is there a way to change parameters from files, inventor, file, closed inventor files using like VBA or VB.net? Um, this person said they heard it was possible with Apprentice. I'm not sure what that is. So Inventor Apprentice is a very stripped down version of Inventor that can only grab a subset of the Inventor file database. Apprentice, I believe you can only change I properties, you cannot change parameters. The reason for that is Apprentice was designed for data management type of operations where they were worrying about file references and file properties, which is the stuff you do from Vault. So it does not, if I remember right, it does not have direct access to um, parameters. You have to have the full inventor API to get access to parameters. And that's because the parameters can change the recipe, i.e. the dimensions and things like that that create the geometry, then update the geometry, then update the graphics, et cetera, et cetera. Inventor Apprentice has no access to the recipe segment, which is basically the database that creates the browser tree. It has no access to the geometry or the graphics segment. So I hope that answered the question. So you need full-blown inventor in order to do that, full-blown inventor API, which means you're using an inventor dot application object, not an inventor dot uh, apprentice server object. Cool, cool. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, what if it's connected with Excel to change the parameter? So if it's connected with Excel to change the parameters, uh, <laughs> I would probably write VB code that's manipulating Excel directly rather than the inventor parameter. It did, I, I would have to see how things are set up to really guide me better than that. But in general, if you've got Excel in the mix and you want to automate 
the, the package as a whole, you're typically writing to the Excel API and the Inventor API. And which one you're writing to when kind of depends on how things are set up. Uh, if I remember right, the Inventor API can ha does have access to get, I know it has access to read the parameters. I can't off the top of my head remember if it has access to write them. But in general, I would be writing directly to the Excel just to keep things simpler and easier. But again, it kind of, it does depend on how things are set up, what kind of performance you're looking for. Um, the other thing is that in general, we only do that if we absolutely have to because that's a customer requirement. Uh, in general, you get a lot more performance if you're dealing with the inventor parameters directly and don't have Excel in the mix when you're talking about like large scale performance types of automations. Cool, cool. I think we can move on. All right. So one last one last set of things that um, uh, I would like to show you. Oh, actually, this was the <laughs> this was that. So yeah, what, what I, the example I just showed you was getting at the file name. And yes, sometimes I don't just use file name when I'm talking about it. <laughs> it's, one of my pet peeves is, is trying to get the file name from some uh, obscure object. Now, drawings making your life easier easier when you're automating drawings. Now, some of this. If you've played around with the Inventor API, you know about, uh, but I, I run into people all the time who don't know about attributes. They're a fundamental part of, of doing Inventor API work on top of, uh, uh, on top of Inventor. The idea behind an attribute is basically a tag. It gets put on basically anything that can be done inside of Inventor. And you use that tag to go back and find it later when you need it. Now, one of, the, one of the things that causes a lot of people heartburn, especially when they're starting out, learning the Inventor API is, how do I get the attribute on the object to begin with? Because attributes are not exposed to the user interface at all. They are 100% completely hidden from the day-to-day -day user. They are only meant to be used by programmers using the API. So um, attributes though make modeling objects and finding them for things like dimensioning a lot, it makes your life a lot easier. Matter of fact, it's the way you want to go for most of setting up your dimensioning automation. Um, but getting the attributes on, the best thing I can recommend, an old colleague of mine from Autodesk, Brian Eakins, wrote something he called Attribute Helper. It is available on his website, eakinsolutions.com slash attribute helper. Um, I will I'll show you that real quick here. So Eakins Solutions, his Attribute Helper, you can download it from here. It installs as an inventor add-in. Now, when you first install it, Inventor, when you start it up, will probably complain a little bit saying it hasn't been built for this version of Inventor. Just tell it to ignore that. <laughs> to be honest, that's, the, that's basically what you do. So after you install it, you go into the add-ins manager. Uh, typically nowadays in more modern Inventor, what it'll be, it'll probably come up as blocked. So just turn block off, tell it to load automatically. And if you click on load or unload it, it'll, it'll load it right then and there. Attribute Manager is a godsend, and what it does is this: is when you when you when you put on when you turn on Attribute Helper, first of all, it shows you all the attributes that are already inside of this. So look at all this stuff that you probably never even knew was there. All the iLogic rules, hey, they're they're in there as attributes. Okay, there's a bunch of parameter values and things like that that are all in there as attributes. Okay. So let me show you something. Let me pull up a couple of, of um, components I've already got set up to demonstrate using attributes and, and, and doing them. So right here, here I have a window pane. Now I went in here uh, ahead of time and I went ahead and I put attributes in on four different faces, okay? So basically the top, bottom, left, and right face. Attributes have three pieces to them. There, it, it, there's something called an attribute set name, okay? Then there's the attribute name and the attribute value. So if I look at this right here, I know it's, it's probably hard to see because the font's really small. Let me do this real quick. There we go. Let's go back to attribute helper. All right. So what it, as I was saying, you can, you can add an attribute to basically any, any geometry. You can add them to parameters. You can add them to properties. You can add them to documents. But for dimensioning, which is, the, which is the example I'm going to show you here, you typically are adding them to either faces or edges. Now, I prefer faces 
The reason being, if you try to do this yourself, you may say, well, Matt, why not edges? Because edges is what creates the, the curves in the drawing. True, but edges also tend to be the most fragile. They're the ones who, on, on an update of model geometry can be destroyed and created faster, which means that if they get destroyed and created, your attribute goes away. So I, I tend to attribute faces and then go find the edges of that face. So in this particular case, on this one, I've got, on this window, I've got a Y face set to lower, which should be the lower face, a Y face set to upper. And I've also got an X, a Z face, because it's in the Z direction, lower, and a Z face upper. So this allows me to understand, you know, go grab my upper or lower faces when I'm dimensioning, okay? Um, I also happen to have the same thing in a wall. So if I come in here and attribute helper, right now I've only got one in here. I have my Y origin because I want to use the wall as my quote unquote origin for dimensioning. Now all I'm missing is a Z. So let me let me add a Z in here so you can show a little bit, so you can see a little bit of how attribute, your, attribute helper can, can help you. When it's activated, you can come in and select a piece of geometry, right click on it and add an attribute set. In this particular case, it, the attribute set name that I want to create is always dim set. Okay, that's my name that I'm using to make sure that my attributes don't conflict with any other programs. Once I've created that, then I can add an attribute. And again, I'm going to call this one the origin. And I'm going to set its value to Z. So basically, this is an origin face Z. And it's the Z origin that I want to use for dimensioning. Okay, close. All right, so that's added that attribute into this wall. Any questions on any of that real quick before we move on? So I'll show you how to use the attributes in a minute, but using attribute helper that Brian created, you don't have to write code to add attributes then to just try to debug and test them. You can use his tool to add your attributes right away. Okay? All right, now that we have that, now let's go in and let's, let's do a little bit of drawing automation here. Now I already have a drawing set up for this because basically these pieces that you're seeing I am creating to use as part of an automation for a company that basically builds clean rooms from piece parts from basically off the shelf kind of Lego blocks. So in this particular case I have actually started the wall of a room and I put two windows in it. I did this mostly for testing so we'll go look at this assembly. So this part is based, this window is basically constrained to two, to two openings. Now the openings, just, to, just so you know, that there's no magic up my sleeve here in a minute. I want you to see this. These are set so that basically these are, um, these lines are um, uh, collinear with each other, okay? They're all set at the same height, okay? That'll be important in a minute. Just keep that in mind that I'm not cheating here. These windows are the exact same instance of the exact same part. They're constrained directly to the, bo to the bottom of those window openings, okay? Now, what I wanna do is this. I basically have two curves here. I wanna, I wanna show you how high the bottom of the window is. That's what my first, the first bit of my automation wants to do. And I wanna show it off of this line, okay, my origin. Now, depending on which side I put the dimension on, whether it's the left or the right, if I do this manually, as a lot of you know, if I was going to put the dimension on the right, or on the, sorry, on the left, I wouldn't grab the one on the right, would I? That's really not good dimensioning practice typically. Typically, what you want to do is you want to grab that line and that line. That's where you want to have your dimension off of. And then you can put like typical or things like that on it. But the best practice is you really don't want the extension line running through something to something next to it if these truly are at the exact same level, which they should be. So here's one of the problems that you run into with drawing automation. Computers are dumb. <laughs> it's basically what it comes down to. So let me show you a little bit. Now, uh, there's gonna be a few things I'm gonna do in here. I'm going to copy and paste a whole bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to sh then I'm going to copy and paste a whole bunch of extensions that I've pre-written, especially given that we're almost out of time. Basically, I've created I've created a whole bunch of extension methods that allow me to do a whole bunch of things for, for my programming very simply and help me debug my drawing code. 
Give me just a second. I'm going to actually wipe this out. Paste it there. There we go. All right. So what did I? What have I created? So first of all, um, you know, I'm going to get the actual document and see this drawing type. I need to get the drawing document, the sheet, and the view that's on there. And then I want to find any of the cur drawing curves that relate to those attributes I showed you. So the dim set origin y and the dim set y face lower. Okay. So I wrote this find curves by attribute. That it basically I give it, it takes the view and I give it the attributes I want to do, and it does a whole bunch of magic to go in and find everything that has that attribute and hand me back the drawing curve. Don't have time to go through the code now, but you will be getting access to it at the end of this. Now, one of the things that, so this is great. This allows me to come in and find all the drawing curves that have that specific attribute and let me sort through them after I found them. Because remember, each window is going to have a Y face lower. So I got to pick between the two. I also want to know what it picked to begin with. One of the things I always hate in drawings when I'm debugging them is I don't know what curve I picked. This doesn't tell me anything. So I wrote a little, a little code here that I call debug, debug fake highlight. It uses what's called a compiler directive. So basically it says, if I'm in debug mode, go in and do this. If I'm not in debug mode, if I change to release here, you'll see it grays those out. It means it won't operate those lines on a release. So I can use it for debugging, but not for release, which helps my, which makes my life a lot easier. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check and see, because I know it will find those two lower edges. The question is, are those two lower edges exact, actually the same height? Anyone wanna bet if they are or they aren't? First of all, I'll make sure that is in there. Second of all, I'm going to break point in here just in case. I'll run this. Drawing dimensions. So, first of all, you see it came in, it selected that line on the bottom from its attributes. Those two lines, my fake highlight is, is what highlighted them for me, changed the color temporarily. But you will notice that it says curves are not at the same height. Well, why not? If I come in here and I look at this, I'll, I'll do what's called a watch. Oops, pause this first. If I come in and look at this, you'll see why. Whoops. Actually, let me, let me rerun this. Hold on a second. Yes, I know. I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually, I'm going to rerun it. I'm going to stop it at an earlier point. Come on. Dimensions, we'll do that again. Now let's look at this. If I look at this, it's 28 point blah, 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 6928 is the last four digits on there of one curve. The other one is 6924. Well, we have rounding, lovely computer rounding errors. So remember when I say we would come back to our little rounding routine, why did I bother writing that in the first place? Is so I could remember to do this when I'm in drawings. So one of the things just to keep in mind is that when you're trying to find curves to decide which one to use and you're kind of comparing them by their start points or their end points, just remember that almost always in drawings because of rounding errors from converting from the model space to the view to the sheet coordinates, you're gonna get rounding errors. Round up to something that's a few less digits and that way when you do your comparisons, are they really at the same height? Are they really at the same position? they will be at the same height because you're getting rid of the rounding errors by taking them out. And that does it. That's everything I wanted to show you today. Um, also, if you want to learn more about some of these more advanced programming things like extension methods and stuff like that, I recommend a few books, um, visualbasic.net, C Sharp uh, 7 for Dummies. I love for Dummies books if you're learning to, to program for the first time. For more advanced programming, Visual Basic 2015 Unleashed or Professional C Sharp 7 and .NET Core 2.0. Those are great references as well. And yes, you can, by the way, you don't have to worry about writing all these down because if you go to this URL, github.com, njbussy, Ateev, ABA, blah, blah, blah. I've already uploaded all the source code that I've shown you today, including the inventor models with their iLogic code. If you have trouble remembering that URL, 
All you have to do is this, just go to GitHub and just do a search, a search for the TAV8 and you'll find it right there. You can get all the source code that I just showed you. Inside here, you also have all of these inventor files with the iLogic in them and the attributes in them. To get attribute helper, just go to Ryan's website. This morning, thanks again, Matt, for joining us. Uh, we'll see you here in the office in a couple of weeks. And for those of you who aren't, uh, you know, employees of Katib, we'll see you next week at uh, 10 a.m. for AVA again. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.